Good ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to Citizen A, where we wrap the week's current affairs with the best political team on television from a very, very Auckland perspective. Warning, we're as fair and balanced as Fox News. Joining me tonight on my revolving panel of bloggers and Auckland opinion shapers, he is the Labour Party spokesperson for Auckland issues, friend to the worker and downtrodden. He is a fighter and a lover, Data 2 MP Phil Twyford. And she is from the Auckland University Department of Film, TV and Media Studies, one of the best bloggers in New Zealand, Phoebe Fletcher. Welcome to you both. Coming up tonight, issue one. John Key attacks the media and then says he didn't attack the media. Legitimate concerns about the fourth estate or the need to get prescription cost increases, union bashing and teacher bashing out of the headlines. Issue two. Paula Bennett has announced a new board of business people to evaluate welfare reforms. What do we pay Paula for and why are they only business people? And issue three, did the revelations of the Sunday Star Times last weekend of how involved John Key was with the financial services hub idea concern anyone else? And we'll end the show on a final word, but let's kick things off with issue one. It's been a redneck's wet dream this week. Union bashing, Benny bashing and teacher bashing topped off with John Key extraordinarily claiming he was being attacked by the liberal media. Phoebe, John Key criticising the New Zealand Herald for being critical is like George W. Bush attacking Fox News for being pinko liberals, isn't it? It's hilarious, actually. It is hilarious and it breaks every public relations rule in the book. And considering the amount of people that he does have working for him in terms of spinning his policies and public relations, it's extraordinary that he would go out and attack the media. But I think that we've seen a much more aggressive stance from Key since the teapot tapes affair where, you know, he basically got the police to search the, yeah, yeah. the, the media. Um, no, it is extraordinary and I think it is to drag attention away from what's going on, but he has been under heat since the dot-com banks fiasco yeah, yeah, yeah. and, you know, I don't think that that's going away. If you look at the criticism that the New Zealand Herald, let's, let's take them as the example, it has been very limp at the best of times and when it has been critical, it's been fairly justified and balanced, hasn't it? It's not like they've gone after him specifically. No, well, I wouldn't really <laughs> compare the Herald to the New Statesman or something like that. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is, you know, the... Um, you know, part of this is, I guess, due to the demands of, on journalists uh, in that they've got, like, kind of short turnarounds. There's mm. not a lot of time to do investigative stories. But I wouldn't say that they've been overly critical of the key government. And he certainly had quite a large honeymoon there. Oh, how and, long was that you know, honeymoon? I think he Three realized, years? <laughs> I think he realised this mistake when he tried to retract it somewhat. <laughs> so he went from attacking it in the morning. Then by the press, press uh, conference in the afternoon, he denied attacking. I think, New Zealand I think he's been taking media advice off Colin Craig. Uh, <laughs> Phil, Key's attempt to attack the, the newspapers is a clever liberal media dog whistle just when those newspapers are writing fairly critical news stories about the second term policies rolling out. So let's have a look at those policies. Is nearly doubling prescription costs going to see children living in poverty die because they can't afford medicine? Yeah, it's winding back uh, some of the gains that were made in terms of social provision. It's going to hit people who are the most vulnerable. Uh, you know, the old and the young are the ones who really benefit from those cheap prescription mm. uh, charges. And, and we're going to see more and more people turning up in accident and emergency clinics uh, this winter because of it. So, um, yeah, they're, they're hurting the people who can least afford. Why? I mean, is th their argument is we're so, we're so hard up for cash now, uh, we've got to almost double these pres prescription costs. But if that was the issue, surely they could raise a tax on the rich, surely? Well, you have to, I think you've got to put all these changes against the backdrop of uh, tax cuts that delivered two and a quarter billion dollars a year to mm. the top 10 percent. Now, um, that's what blew a huge hole in, in the government accounts. And, and the zero budget that they're delivering now is a consequence of those tax cuts and their failure to grow the economy. Is this attack on the media a smokescreen to try and hide that mismanagement, that absolute economic mismanagement? Well, I think that, you know, Key's been lulled into a sense of false security by this extraordinary long honeymoon of, uh, you know, where he hasn't been held up to basic mm. standards of scrutiny. Uh, he's not used to it. I think when you saw um, Paula Bennett rolling out the, um, su the uh, subsidised contraceptives for uh, women on the benefit, you mm. could see Stephen Joyce uh, looking at his options and going, oh yeah, we'll pick that one off the shelf and uh, plug it in. You know, yeah. they're clearly, it's th these, uh, some of these announcements are a response to the news agenda. Yeah. The banks, the, the John Dot Banks uh, affair continues to, uh, to roll Oh, on. it's just dirty, isn't it? It's now, it's, it's now reached filthy levels, hasn't it? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I thought that the um, the account um, that had been, you know, obviously given by um, uh, by Kim dot com of um, John Banks refusing to take his phone call when Kim dot com was languishing in Mount Eden. Rem remarkable, isn't Absolutely it? Absolutely amazing stuff. Phoebe, allowing the bosses to dictate a collective agreement and allowing bosses to walk away if unions reject unreasonable demands. Are these new labour laws, which Darian Fenton's been all over this week, by the way, mm. amount to national declaring war on the union movement? This is this is this is for keeps now, isn't it? I think it is for keeps, and I think we have you know seen a rise in industrial actions quite clearly, Ports of Auckland, AFCO, and I think that these were changes that National always wanted to, to drag through. They wanted to make things easier for employers and get rid of the unions as a barrier in terms of preserving workers' rights. But should you should should bosses be able to? Um, bargain in bad faith. That's what, that's what we're almost going back to now, isn't it? I don't think they should. I think that there does need to be protection for workers. And I think that the results of not having that protection are the things that we are seeing now. Like mm. we are seeing large scale industrial disputes that are not being resolved quickly or easily. So be, do you think because of the uncertainty National have injected into the entire labour uh, relations uh, environment, that uncertainty is, is, is allowing employers to overreach and push and see how far they can get things? Um, I think so. I mean, we had the 90-day right to fire as mm. well. So, yes, I think it has created a, an additional uncertainty in the job environment. Phil, uh, National promised, they swore, black and blue, hand on heart, hand on Bible, that they would never touch frontline services. How on earth are teachers not frontline services? And why is Treasury lecturing education on policy? Mm. The frontline services thing was always a sham, in my view. I mean, when you strip away uh, support services... Uh, take an, a, you know, a hospital, for example, if you strip away the administrative staff, are you going to have highly paid doctors then uh, managing the files and, and doing the paperwork? Mm, it's, it's, mm. It was always a nonsense. Uh, I think that um, uh, National's assault on the education sector, that is, that is really core ideological territory right. uh, for National. And, um, and I think they're playing for, for keeps now. Uh, I think that... Uh, setting out, you know, reducing class sizes as a measure of progress, which is sort of what we've seen this week mm, mm. with the announcements is, uh, is bizarre and should send a shiver down the spine of parents uh, as well as teachers. We have, you know, we have a fantastic education yes, system. Yes, yeah, well, one of the best public education systems in the world. It's why not, why are we perfect. tinkering? Why are we tinkering? It's not perfect, yep. but, but National's whole um, thrust is about um, a more competitive market-based model for education. Mm. Charter schools, Clearly, a Trojan horse for bulk funding and mm. privatisation mm. of trying to undermine the power of the of the unions. Um, uh, they've really done a huge amount of damage to the education sector. Mm. Teachers, are, 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 uh, morale has gone through the floor. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we should be doing is trying to empower good teachers and give them the resources to do their job better. Isn't this injecting a false competition model by the national standards? I mean, they want to try and rank everyone and then base it on that. But we know that those national standards are educationally flawed because at a certain age, they're not that practical to use. But, but Why are we implementing something that so many academics have absolutely spat on? That's right. And the great irony of it is that um, what they say they, they're doing is trying to address the so-called long tail of underachievement. That's right, that's right. Well, actually, uh, moving to a more competitive market-based uh, education model is going to undermine the very uh, capacity of schools that are struggling in low-income areas. Mm. So uh, it's going to empower the schools in the rich areas who are, who are teaching the, you know, the children of well-off uh, middle class families, it's going to gut the ability of low income schools in, in areas like we're talking where I come from to do the job. As a lecturer, you know the importance of um, time with each student. Do you think increasing the numbers is the answer? Absolutely not. And um, I know, well, I know a lot of teachers, um, both um, in the tertiary sector and also in, you know, sort of primary school, mm. intermediate, high school. And all of them would say that increasing the class size makes it much harder to give that one-on-one -on -one time to students. Mm -hmm. It is the students that suffer, particularly the students with problems um, and the ones that do need that additional help. I mean, even if you're very talented and bright, you can benefit from more one-on-one -on -one time. Sure. The class becomes harder to teach. It mm. actually takes longer to get through material as well. Any teacher will tell you that, that there will end up being less material taught. Question of both of you, final on this. Uh, National say over and over again that they've blunted the sharp edges of the recession. Do this week's policy rollouts show that they're now sharpening the edges of that recession? Yeah, and it's kind of like a sore tooth 
you know, and every little announcement is a sharp point that they're jamming into uh, low-income New Zealanders and people who are struggling to get by. They've g given up on softening the edges, haven't they? I think they have given up on softening the edges, and I think that the environment is, you know, going to get harder for them, I think. And that's one thing, um, I guess, why Key is kind of, you know, complaining that he's under attack at yeah, the moment, yeah, yeah. is that there is beginning to be increasing fo focus on these policies that he's putting through. Thank you, panel. Moving on to issue two. Paula Bennett has announced this week a new board of business people to oversee vast new welfare reforms. Phil, we pay Paula Bennett over $200,000 per year, plus perks, plus the resources of a massive ministry. So why are we now paying $1.1 million for a new quango that will oversee Paula's welfare reforms? Isn't that what we pay her for? Yeah, this is a, this is a state-sanctioned lobby group to basically ginger up and push along the, uh, the nutty recommendations of the welfare working group. And, and why? It's because National fundamentally doesn't trust independent public servants to do their job. And we see this all over the place. Look, they handed over two-thirds of the New Auckland to hand-picked corporate boards that's to right, run that's right. because they didn't trust elected representatives to mm. run the New Auckland Council. So they corporatized the whole deal. This is their default option, hand-picked corporate advisors to come in and set policy. We see Murray McCulley doing it in uh, Foreign Affairs. That's right. And actually, National want to roll out this model, this kind of hand-picked corporate board, across all uh, manner of different government departments and ministries. But so government's not a business. Government's not a business, Phil. No. And Why they, are we listening to business people over government policy? And they are, I believe, corroding the very um, um, heart of, of our political system, which is based on an independent public service, mm. accountable to our le elected representatives, and operating in the public interest. Mm. So what National are doing is they want to bring in these hand-picked corporate boards to run everything, and uh, it undermines that, that fundamental part of our democracy. Phoebe, every single appointee is a business person. When the impacts on the sector will be so wide-ranging, why isn't there one person with actual experience with the welfare sector on this board? Well, there's Catherine McPherson, who's a professor at AUT in rehabilitation yes. on the board, and she's the one person, she was in the welfare working group as That's well right. with Paula Rebstock, um, that does have some experience. I mean, as, as an academic, I would say that this concerns me. Usually when you select a board, you select people with suitable expertise, mm. and there just does not seem to be really, you know, one out of five is appalling. Yeah, the, the, yeah. This is not a board that has been selected. You know, um, former head of the Land Transport Safety Authority, you know, um, <laughs> the Commerce Commission, Paula Rebstock. The people on here just simply do not have the experience in welfare, and I think that that is um, going to flow on, and that you're going to get policies that are not well considered, uh, that are made on other people's recommendations, that are perhaps lacking in the research and level of depth and nuance that is needed. This is a razor gang, isn't it? It is this a razor, is a razor gang, gang, yes. And the cuts are going to be pretty deep? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, there was a lot in that Welfare Working Group's report that they thought uh, was too controversial to push through. That's and right. I think um, we're seeing with the establishment of this board um, that some of those ideas, you know, moving towards more of a kind of, um, you know, we've got the notion of bringing in insurance models uh, um, uh. to apply to welfare. I think we're going to see some of those more controversial ideas beginning to be pushed back through again. Phil, Bennett's appointment selection clearly suggests there's only business outcomes that matter. Why isn't poverty reduction the only concern of welfare? Why is it business? Mm. Why is it a business model? Well, it, on one level, it's the privatisation of, our, of policy making, uh, but um, it, it reveals what nationals, uh, it reveals their kind of ideological mindset, if you like, and they don't want to admit that, po that actually social inequality and poverty is the root cause of so many of the social problems mm. that government spends all its time trying to fix. And it, we saw that recently where John Keyes announced a, a little initiative to deal with rheumatic fever, which yeah. is one of the classic third world diseases that, that um, we have shamefully high levels of now in New Zealand. And they're dealing with it as if it's a medical problem. Yeah. Well, hello, it's yeah. not. It's caused yeah. by poverty. You know, the, the uh, welfare states of Scandinavia and Northern Europe, they haven't seen rheumatic fever on this scale in the last 60 years because mm. their welfare states got rid of it. Yeah. And we brought it back in New Zealand. And Why aren't people angry? I mean, they, 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 can, they can see the poverty is getting worse around us. Are they not putting on national and the economic management? Are they putting it on something else? Well, because I, we, seem to be, we seem to have a culture now where it's mm, blaming the poor. Mm. Well, it's their fault. It's their fault they live that way. Mm. 
Well, I think some people are angry, and, and I think that the dominant mindset that people have had that Key's a good bloke, we've got to give him a chance, Every, it, all countries are finding it hard because of the GFC. I think these, um, that kind of thinking is really uh, on, the, on the decline now and people are taking a more critical look. The fact that the news media are holding the government to account more, I think, reflects that change of mood. Right, so right. Phoebe, if social needs are no longer the focus of welfare, what are the, what are the ramifications? Well, <laughs> I think the ramifications are that we're going to see, you know, um, additional costs in terms of our healthcare system. I mean, that's one thing that Phil is talking about, that a lot of these problems are related to poverty. They mm. simply cannot be solved um, by attacking things like solo mothers, um, by attacking the poor. Mm. Uh, and I think um, the other flip side of that is that um, that social inequality also makes it, I guess, harder for us to live together as a society too. Yeah. So I think that these, um, you know, are, are terrible reforms, really. Question, uh, final question to both of you. Will this business focus improve the lives of the 250,000 New Zealand children living in poverty right now? I don't think it'll do a damn thing, and it will quite possibly make it worse. Worse? Mm. I don't think it will do anything. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving on, ladies and gentlemen, to the third uh, issue tonight. Fascinating article by the brilliant Matt Nippet in the Sunday Star Times mm. at the beginning of the week, detailing how personally involved John Key was in the attempted setup of the financial services hub. Did the revelations in the Sunday Star Times last weekend um, shock you? Not particularly. I mean, I guess this has been something that's been under discussion since the 1980s, yeah. was this idea of New Zealand as a financial hub. And, you know, the reason why it's never gone through is because there are major reasons why it would not work. Right. I mean, even, you know, in, in 2010, we had uh, the Security Commission, I believe, was looking at, you know, attracting um, PIEs, Portfolio Investment Equity, to New Zealand. The problem is that we don't really, uh, okay, we've got a tiny slot in terms of time zone, um, but we've got you know, countries like Singapore and Hong Kong and Sydney that already have that market. Mm. Um, and the, the issue, as I understand it around it, was that um, we didn't have enough of the bigger players involved, which I guess was why Key was meeting the head of Goldman Sachs. Mm. But the other issue is that you create these kind of loopholes in taxation that New Zealanders would take advantage of. Yeah. You know, so that, that could mean that the IRD is kind of chasing Australia, you know, in terms of the way that, um, you know, so, so there's two problems there, whether we actually, you know, attract that level of um, investment in the market or whether, you know, we're opening up loopholes and opening up something that becomes a bureaucratic nightmare. So as I understand it, every time it's been discussed, it's been kind of uh, pushed off the table. Phil, never before have we seen a Prime Minister so personally involved in deals. In this example, mm. Key overrode official advice to privately meet with corporate executives to cut a deal that would cost us millions in taxes, wouldn't return the profits, and it looked to breach international tax treaties. Is key cutting deals in the interests of New Zealand or because he's addicted to cutting deals? Mm. Well, I think coming right hot on the heels of the Sky City yeah, yeah. casino uh, fiasco, this is really a, a fascinating insight, the story, and, and credit to Matt Nippet for... Mm. Uh, really nailed it, for, really for nailed he it. He did, and uh, it shows key in his natural environment, yeah. and, uh, and it's all about cutting deals. Um, I think it's interesting the, the extent to which key is... Uh, willing to subsidise and chuck taxpayers' money at, at business interests. That is a re a re remarkable. But I think it also shows um, that, that this government and John Keyes and Stephen Joyce's idea of, of what our, our economic development possibilities are mm. as a country, basically it's about casino capitalism. And we saw that with Sky City. Yeah. And what greater casino uh, is there than the international finance markets? Yeah. And so Key's idea of our, of our economic destiny is to make us the Cayman Islands of the South Pacific at the very time that the OECD is cracking down on tax havens yeah, yeah, yeah. because they're gutting the tax revenue of, of countries around the That's world. Right. So uh, it's pretty shocking and uh, it, it, it shows how bereft they are. We've got, you know, the Sky City deal, we've got this, the cycle way. You know, where are the other great ideas? Does it reek of crony capitalism when you've got a prime minister directly inserting himself into the negotiations of deals against the advice of the officials and the bureaucracy that you have set up to manage these types of things? Doesn't mm. it, isn't it slightly dangerous? What if he gets a bad deal? What if he cuts something in a really bad way? 
Where's the counter? Where's the counterweight? Where's the check and balance in that? Yeah, it certainly breaks all the, the rules of good government. Absolutely. And it, and it shows that um, Key is fundamentally a traitor. Mm. And I think that you know this will this story will have rung alarm bells all over New Zealand. Because the question you left wondering is, well, what are the values here? What's the long-term game plan? What's in it for New Zealand? And and I don't think those are questions, to be honest, that John Key asks himself very often. Phoebe, do we have a Prime Minister or a Trader-in-Chief? I think it's quite clear we've got a Trader-in-Chief. <laughs> Why? Why is he allowed to do this? That's not what the Prime Minister should be doing. Not sitting down and cutting private deals with friends or mates that he knows around in the business world. Why is it being allowed to happen? Because no one's too, everyone's too scared of it? Well, I guess this sort of stuff actually does happen in government and it has done for quite some time. Yep. Um, but I, I think there, you know, that many of these deals are beginning to come out. You know, the dot com one, for example, um, you know, where you've got that increasing trail that actually goes back yeah. to key. Um, it, it is remarkable how much he's inserting himself in these deals and, you know, it really is leaving a kind of trail where it can come back to bite him. Uh, final question, will the financial services hub go ahead and should the deal be in secret the way the corporations wanted to be? There was a big issue about how they wanted to make all the parts of it secret. Are we going to see it? It looks to me like it's a dead duck. Right. Yeah, I, I can't see it flying, and uh, and and the reasons and the, the official papers that Matt Nippet quoted yeah. in that piece uh, indicate that it just didn't stack up. Um, high risk, big upfront investment by the New Zealand taxpayer yeah. into the pockets of the likes of Goldman Sachs. <laughs> just doesn't look like a good idea. I that's don't think that's going to fly. <laughs> Going to fly, going to die? No, I think it's going to die. I mean, I think the, the, the fact that John Key is beginning to back away from it says, mm. you know, volumes at the moment. Let's wrap the show with last word. Phoebe, your last word this week. My last word actually has to be on long-term contraception for 15 to 19-year-olds. Uh, my understanding, and I've spoken to a few medical professionals, uh, are that things like IUDs and the injection actually have major health concerns uh, associated with them. Um, you know, for example, increased risk of pelvic infection with IUDs. And these are not usually things that are recommended for people of that age. So with uh, the idea that contraception should be encouraged by wind staff onto beneficiaries, I would like to see more medical investigation of that, and particularly the issue around condoms, considering that one in five women in the Bay of Plenty have been treated for chlamydia. I think that we have got a burgeoning um, STD crisis potentially that might result out of you know, handing over those medical powers to one staff. I, don't, I do not think it's correct at all. Uh, should that discussion be with your doctor or with a wind staff member? Something <laughs> as personal as that. Shouldn't it be with your doctor? Why? It should absolutely be with your doctor. And should and you be forced to have you know, it with a wind staff member? Um, considering that they cut, what was it, 12 million, I think it was, for the STD program, um, that, you know, they've cut that money and then to go, we're giving 1 million, <laughs> you know, okay. th that money belongs with family planning. Uh, Phil, your final word this week. The government's just announced um, they are um, shutting down the program to allow people to build affordable homes and, and to get into their first homes at the Hobsonville development, which is going to have 3,000 new homes in it. It's, it's government-funded, taxpayer-funded land and housing development. They've given up on it having any affordable homes there. When John Key was elected, he stripped out the Housing New Zealand homes that uh, were going to be, there were, there were supposed to be 500 Housing New Zealand and 500 more affordable homes in that 3,000 home development. They've given up on trying to solve the, pro wow. the affordability crisis for, for housing in Auckland. Uh, we, it's a terrible crisis that is, is uh, exacerbating poverty and inequality. People, a whole generation of young people in Auckland are uh, watching the prospect of owning their own home slip out of their grasp, mm. and this government has got nothing to say about it. Thank you, Phoebe. Thank you, Phil. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to my final word, AFCO have complained that David Shearer doesn't, didn't visit them after he visited striking workers on the picket line. AFCO seem confused why David didn't visit them, so I'll explain it for them. Dear AFCO, the reason David Shearer didn't visit you is because, being the leader of the Labour Party, David Shearer doesn't visit scum. Let's be clear. A corporate making $20 million in profits, taken over by a family worth $300 million, using hunger 
as a negotiating tactic to crush their workers is nothing short of scum. To use the 5,000 children who are reliant on those jobs as collateral damage makes AFCO nothing but scum. To redefine locked out workers as strikers so that those hundreds of families were no longer eligible for the emergency benefit makes AFCO scum. AFCO have used tactics so low they make the ports of Auckland look like a good employer. The social damage this filthy rich company and their filthy rich family are prepared to wage on some of the most vulnerable workers in the country should be decried from every New Zealander who cares about social justice. If you like tonight's show, please join our Citizen A Facebook site and connect with other like-minded new citizens and follow me on my Citizen Bomber Twitter and Facebook page. Don't forget my new show, The Union Report, plays 8pm Monday nights here on Triangle TV, the home of original public broadcasting. Thanks for watching, Fana. Good night, Aotearoa. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.